Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of all of the people involved in Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're so blessed that you can be with us, and I pray that God would use us to be a blessing to you. It certainly blesses me to spend time in his word. I wish we could be together, but there you have it. Just look me up when we get there, all right? Okay. We're continuing on, as I said, in our, our study of the letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. And this is the, is the 11th part of that study. Uh, I do want to say this. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. It is the very breath of God. It brings life. God's Word has that power to bring life. So there's no verse that's more important than another verse, because all Scripture is God-breathed. That said, there are certain scriptures that I know that the church needs to become much more familiar with. And oftentimes, those are the ones we think are boring, so we avoid them. Don't avoid any of the Word of God. Trust me on that. I have always said that, that I, I believe that the most important teaching in all scripture is the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. Those three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That is the transition from being religious to being righteous. And that's what makes that so important. And then, of course, there's the letter to the Romans, and especially, particularly in the 8th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. I mean, that so reveals who we saints are in the sight of God. It's, it's imperative that you have that knowledge. But I believe that this part of the letter to the Ephesians that we're going into has that same kind of weight that we really need to become familiar with this. It needs to become part of it. You know, there's an old saying, you are what you eat. You better take this word in and eat it. Oh, oh taste and see that the Lord is good, it says in the Psalms. And Jeremiah said, that word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. So I pray that you would ingest, that you would just take God's word here. It's not, it's not my commentary or my comments. But it's God's word that we're going to look at that has that power of life, power of life in your life. So that's all I have to say about that. But I do have to say this. Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would use this time in our lives, all of us who are watching now or later on, or that you would use it to touch us, to cause us to grow in you, to grow in our knowledge of your son, Christ Jesus, to grow in our knowledge of your grace and mercy to grow in our knowledge of the Holy Spirit that you sent to lead us into all truth. And I pray, Lord God, before we start, that nothing would come out of my mouth that you have not put in my heart. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. Amen and amen. All right, we were in chapter 3 when we left off last week, Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to pick up today, uh, I'm going to read from verse 7. Ephesians 3, 7. So Paul is talking about the gospel. He says, The gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So Paul starts here by saying, I, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. According to the gift of God's grace, according to the working of God's power. Paul's ministry started with Jesus showing him what he would have to suffer on the road to Damascus. Go we'll read it in Acts chapter 9. That, that particular verse is Acts 9, 16. So God didn't pull any punches. She said, you know, what would count the cost. But he showed Paul what the cost would be. And Paul didn't have a problem with that. I think a lot of people looking to go into ministry today are looking at the benefits because they look and see so many prosperous 
Well, I'm not going to talk about prosperity, but I am going to talk about this. To serve Christ as a minister of his gospel, you better be prepared to pay the price, whatever the price may be. For most of our history, in the last 2,000 years, the people that have gone on to serve God greatly have paid quite a price because the world hated Jesus and the world will hate us also. They don't love you because you preach the gospel. And if they do love you because you preach the gospel, you better take a break, go into your prayer closet and pray and make sure it is the gospel that you're preaching. Remember, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy in, in chapter 3, verse 1, 1 Timothy 3, 1, and he said this, it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. It's a good thing to desire to serve in ministry. But as I said, Jesus said we have to count the cost, not examine the worldly benefits that you get from ministry, because true service does not generally come with that connected, fame and fortune, all right? Jesus washed the feet of his apostles on that last night, in that last supper. And at that time, he proclaimed that that was the example, to serve and not to be served. That's Jesus. I mean, it shocked Peter, right? When, when, here is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Here is God Almighty. I mean, and he is there washing the feet of his apostles. And Peter's saying, no, not me. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part of me. He said, well, let me wash the whole thing. I mean, Peter was impetuous and had a heart for God. That's what he did. But then Jesus said, this is, he said to his, his apostles, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. Luke 22, 25 and 26. So the call to ministry is a call to serve. Okay. Here in this letter, Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's here in Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. So he's saying, this, this is what you have to have. You've got to know the love of Christ. Because that's the ministry. I don't care what ministry you have. The ministry is always to pass along the love of Christ, the love of God, the Father, through the love of Christ. The goal of our instruction is love. That's what, that's what it's all about. And how can you teach, how can you share what you don't have? So you had better come to know the love of God. How do you know the love of God? You get on your face. You get on your face. You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You spend time hand in hand with Jesus. That's how you get to know it. Doesn't come, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with getting an education. You may go to a seminary or Bible college or whatever. But that's not what you're going to get to learn, the most basic thing that you need to be equipped for the work of service. And that is face-to-face -face with Jesus Christ, with the Holy, through the Holy Spirit. The heart of ministry, the heart of ministry is the love of Christ. Because that is the visible evidence of the love of the Father. You understand that? The love of Christ, his love for us, is the visible evidence of God the Father's love for us. The goal of our instruction, as I said, is love. That's what I, I'm saying I said. It. That's what Paul said. The goal of our instruction is love. The goal is not fame and fortune. The goal is not to be, you know, a great job. The goal is to serve and bring the message of God's love. So now in verse 20, Ephesians 3.20, Paul wrote, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. You never have to ask, you never have to beg God to be good to you. I mean, that seems to be what so many people are being taught. 
Do you not know it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? All the things will be added to you. Matthew 6.33. You don't have to seek the things. You need to seek God. All the rest will be added. All the rest of what? All the rest of the things you need. There in Matthew 6, he's talking about food. He's talking about clothing. He's talking about the necessities of life. They'll be added to you. You know, in Deuteronomy 28, where it talks about if you hear God's voice and you obey God's voice, he'll bless you. He promises to bless you. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to give you Cadillacs and Mercedes, but he's going to bless you. I don't know how he's going to do it because that's between him and you. You know, it's actually up to him, period. But the idea is that it says that he'll bless you in the city, he'll bless you in the country. It doesn't matter where you are, he'll bless you. And he'll bless you whether you're going in or coming out. And it says that the blessings of God will come upon you and overtake you. Do you get that? I'm telling you that instead of you having to run around and try and get God to bless you, that if you're following and obeying his word, those blessings will come and find you. They will flat run you over. I mean, they will come and get you. Okay. If we have food and covering, Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 8. With these, we shall be content. How much contentment do you see in the world around you? Virtually none. The problem is, I don't think we see enough contentment in the church. People are dissatisfied. I want more. I want more. I want more, too. I want more. I want a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. With God. I want a deeper relationship. I want more of God the Father in my life. That's the more I want. Not more stuff. Because, you know, Job hit, it right on, hit the nail on the head. So naked you came into this world, naked you're going out. You're not taking anything with you. That's the Egyptians. You know, go build a, a pyramid so you can put all the good stuff. I mean, it's ridiculous, all right? All right, I want to move into the fourth chapter. I've been looking forward to getting into this fourth chapter. Because, again, I think this fourth chapter of Ephesians is so, so important. And it starts in the first verse. I'm going to read the first three verses. Paul says, therefore I... The prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. All that first word, therefore. You know what the therefore is there for? It connects everything that Paul has said so far in the letter. To what he's about to say. There's a reason for God giving you the word. There's always a reason. He, he gives you this, and it, but it's there for a reason. So he's saying, therefore, it's for connecting what Paul said, what he's already written up to this point. And he says, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So the, all the things that he's talked about so far, their purpose is to cause you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. This letter, the word, will bring faith. That's what it does. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you hear the word of God, faith will go inside of you. But then faith has to bring action. You know, it says, Paul wrote, and he said, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word is in your heart. You believe with your heart, but then you have to confess with your mouth. But then you have to be able to live it. Otherwise, you become ineffective. You become foolish. And he says, with all humility and gentleness. You know, it's Solomon, with all of his wisdom, when he was running and out of wisdom, he said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. You've got to make sure. Pride is insidious, and pride will get you every time. And that devil will come along, and he'll either tell you you're no good, or he'll tell you you're too good. But the fact of the matter is, all you want to be is like Jesus. And it, he, that's why he says here, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Because it's not about you. It is about us. We are the body of Christ. We are the body. I think we talked about this quite a bit last week. It's not just about me, it's just about us, right? That you that's used so often is plural, okay? We are the body of Christ. So there has to be unity, unity among the saints. Now, don't, don't lose sight of this. He's not talking about unity between us and 
any other religion or any other pagan religion or any other religion that does not honor and follow Jesus Christ. But he's talking about here, among inside the body, we have to have that unity. Now, you know, it's very clear because Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. So when we're talking about unity, we're not talking about unity with everybody, which is one of the fallacies that's taken place in the quote-unquote church throughout the world today. It's like, you know, let's all get together. Can't we all get together and be friends? The simple fact of the matter is you cannot have unity with an unbeliever unless you become an, an unbeliever. Now, you may not even realize it. I mean, you know, that's how subtle. Remember, the first revelation of the serpent was that he was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the field. He will try and induce you. I mean, I, I just, it, it, it's troubled me so much in, in the past years when I, as I travel overseas particularly, and I see all these movements to bring people together. Let's get this denomination to come together with this denomination, and we'll just all have coffee and cake and have a prayer together. You know what? That's not unity. Unity is when there are no denominations, when all there is is Jesus Christ in our life. There's going to be a one world church. There's going to be a one world religion. There's going to be a one world government because there will be unity and that unity will be among all of the unbelievers. Sitting in a pew does not a saint make. Okay, listening to a pipe organ does not a saint make. No tithing, no singing, nor any of a thousand church works. Jesus said we would know people by their fruit. Or know them by the absence of that fruit. We're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, go look it up. Love, joy, peace. Go look it up and see. It says, let a man examine himself. Are those things evident in your life? The Sermon on the Mount and the letter to the Romans and now Ephesians defines here the culture of Christianity. Do you know that Christianity has a culture? Absolutely it does. It has because it has its own language. What? I'm not talking about Latin. I'm talking it has a language. It's a language of love. It's let no unwholesome word proceed from your lips. Okay? It's, it's, it's about that language. Okay? There has to be evidence of your faith. It has to be visible. James wrote, and James, I'm going to read from James 1, uh, 22 and 23. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, walks away and forgets. Okay? You have to be a person of faith, a faith that resists evolves into action in your life. Let me just talk a little more about unity here, because that's where Paul is going with this. We're in Ephesians 4, reading from 4, 5, and 6, he said, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's unity. There's one body. There's one church, right? Which one is it? Presbyterian, Catholic, Episcopalian? What's the one church? You see, that's part of the problem. It's not about that kind of church. It's a family affair. And the scripture makes that quite clear. It is about the spirit of God bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. You're part of the family. It's not about belonging to an organization. You, I mean, this is an important thing because it seems like the organization is the most important thing to them is getting you to be part of the organization. That's not what God's great desire is. God's great desire is that through Jesus Christ, you would come to have a, a relationship with him and you would be able to call him Abba, Father. That you would recognize him and know him as Father.
No, I said to Alice this morning, we were talking, and I don't remember what word I was saying. Uh, let me just ask you, I mean, do you know Tom Cruise? Do you know Tom Cruise? No, you don't. No, you don't. You know about him. You don't know him at all. This is what's happened in this in this in this couple last couple of generations with movies, with Facebook, with radio. All of a sudden, you know about somebody and you think you know them. So many people who call themselves Christians know about Jesus and never come to know Jesus. You have to have that relationship where you know Him, and He knows us. I mean, that's what He said in John. He said, "My sheep know Me. My, you hear My voice. He knows us." He knows every hair on our head. It's not about knowing about him. It's good to know about him. It's good to know his teaching. But if you don't know Jesus, you could be headed very, very much in the wrong direction. Okay. Let me move on to uh, verse. I want to read verses 11 and 13 here in this fourth chapter. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, the knowledge of the Son of God. That's what I just got through talking about. Do you know Jesus? Now, I'm not, it's not, not do you know about him. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. In so many big churches, people, they talk about the pastor like he was their best, but they never, they don't know him at all. They know about him. They may see him once a week. They may see him. To know somebody is to be intimately involved in their lives. I want to tell you, Christ has no desire that other than anything than to be intimately involved in your life. Intimacy. Intimacy is the word we don't hear enough in the church. Do you know Jesus or do you know about him? You know, what do you have to do to know Jesus? I want to read uh, Paul, such a blessed man, so used of God. Here's what he said in Philippians. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, dung, so that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. There's a cost to knowing Christ. Paul said he gave up everything to know Christ. And listen, this is personal. You know, I've been, I've been saying this is about the church. It's, uh, it's about us. But there comes a time when the most important thing is not about us. It's about you. It's about me. It's about my personal relationship with the Lord. I mean, you can go to a church. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll never know the people in that building. So to know him means to be in his footsteps, with his mind, with his surrendered attitude, and his words to the Father on our lips. Yet not my will but thy will be done. Luke 22, 40. That's where you start to know Christ. When you can honestly say from the depths of your heart, not my will, but thy will be done. When you have surrendered to Christ, then you will know Christ. So he goes on in verse 14 to say, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. We're no longer to be children. You now Paul wrote, he said, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Did you get that? Did you catch that part where he said, I used to speak like a child, think like a child? Did you ever notice the order? <laughs> to to speak before you think. That's what children do. That's that, that isn't that that's, that's exactly what he said. I used to I used to speak like, I used to think like. Make sure you think before you speak. All right, or better yet, check with the Lord. Why does why do you think that it, 
the, the speaking comes before the thinking. That's the epitome of childishness. So James, the Apostle James, cautioned us against that because he instructed us, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone who must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James 1.19. There's the order. you got to hear before you speak. The Word of God says, it says in Hebrews, that anything not done in faith is sin. Faith comes by hearing. You better make sure that you're hearing. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a lot of things in sin and not even recognize it. So we're not to be childish. We're to be mature. That's the opposite of childish, right? Mature. Maturity. And by the way, maturity is not about how the number, how old you are. It's about how committed you are. It's how sold out you are to the Lord. But in Hebrews 5.14, a verse I love and I've preached all over the world about, Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice, exercise, it says in the King James, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Hebrews 5.14. You've got to train your senses. God gave us senses. Our head is like a computer. It has to be an input device. You can't just zip open your brain and stuff the word of God down. The input devices that God has given us are our five senses. Our hearing, our seeing, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, and our sense of touch. Okay? You got to hear. But Jesus said, be careful what you listen to. It's like a radio. You got to tune in what's right. Even David, a man after God's own heart, when he was listening to the wrong thing, go read it in the Psalms. He said, when I listened to the voice of the enemy, I was distracted. He became fearful when he listened to the voice of the enemy. Tune out the enemy and tune in God. Make sure you do that, right? You have to see. How, what are you supposed to see? God didn't give you eyes to look at new cars. and God gave you eyes so you could fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith. That's what you have to do with your eyes. You've got to train yourself to be looking at Jesus Christ. Smell. You know, we live in a stinky world. And it's getting stinkier by the day. I'm not just talking about natural pollution. I'm talking about sin. Because it says in Isaiah 24 that the whole earth is polluted by the transgressions of man. Sin stinks. If you don't know that, you're not paying attention. So we're the air freshener. Because we bring, we're the fragrant aroma, bringing in the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. We're God's air freshener in this whole world. Taste. I said it before. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That word was found and I ate it. You gotta be eating God's word. You gotta be ingesting it. You gotta be taking it in because then it'll become part of you and touching. That's the, other, that's the last sense, right? Those are the five senses hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. Think about that woman who, after 12 years of that pain and sorrow, came up and touched the hem of his garment. Maybe it's time, maybe there's a need in your life. That you need to reach out and touch Jesus Christ. Because he's waiting. He wants to walk hand in hand with you. It's not even a matter of grabbing the time of his garment. He wants to grab you. He wants to hug you. He wants to love you. And he wants to provide all of your needs in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, once again, you zip through and run out of time. So I, I pray that this time will bless you. And I pray, Father, that you would use this word, your word, to invigorate us, Lord, to make us more like your son, to chop away the things that are not like your son in our life, that we might be more like him and fulfill, see the fulfillment of your word, that you have predestined us to be conformed into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. Help us to take this love that you've poured into our hearts and take it out into the world as we go this week and touch other lives. Use it, Lord God, to touch other lives with your love. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit and by your grace, Lord God, that many will come to know you, to know you, not know about you. I pray that, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, until next week, why don't you write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you, hear where you're, where you're watching from or listening from. And pray for us. If you have prayer needs, write to us and we'll pray for you. 
God bless you and goodbye until next time. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love.